stretched forth the hand has more than one meaning in the Bible. The Bible says his hand was restored whole as the other. It means a healthy, happy, well-balanced, and wholesome personality. For the word hand means power, strength of the Almighty within you. Numbers of people are sick, unhappy, dissatisfied, inept, and inefficient. Their attitude toward life is all wrong. Moreover, their work is shoddy and desultory. They do not sing in their, in their hearts at their work. Whenever you turn with confidence and trust to the almighty power within, knowing that you are guided, directed by this inner light, and that you are expressing yourself fully, you will actually become a channel for the divine, and you will move from glory to glory. The dreams, ambitions, ideals, plans, and purposes of many are withered and frozen in the mind because they do not know how to bring their desires and ideals to pass. The external world denies their desire, not knowing that the laws of mind, not knowing the laws of mind and how to pray scientifically. They find their wonderful ideas die aborning in their minds, resulting in frustration and neurosis. If you look around you in your office or factory, you will see many people with a withered hand. They are stagnating, literally dying on the vine. Life is progressive. Life is growth. There is no end to our unfoldment or creativeness. We wither our hand, that is our ability to achieve and accomplish, by saying, if I had John's brains or his wealth, or Tom's connections, I could advance and be somebody. But look at me, just a nobody. I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. I must be satisfied with my lot. I have a withered hand. That's a foolish philosophy of life. This is the way many people talk. They are constantly demoting and depreciating themselves. Yet within each person is the living Spirit Almighty. It's all-powerful, it's all-wise, knows all and sees all. That presence and power could reveal their hidden talents to them, because we're all unique. There's no one in all the world like you, because you are you. God had need of you where you are, otherwise you'd not be here. Liquidate, banish, and eradicate from your mind, fear, doubt, and ill will. Trust the Divine Presence completely. Go all the way out on a limb and say with feeling and humility and with faith and confidence, I can do all things through the God power and awareness which strengthens, guides, comforts and directs me. Watch the wonders you will perform. Stretch forth your hand by enlarging your concept or estimate of yourself. Aim high, raise your sights. Realize you will always go where your vision is. And your vision is what you're looking at, what you're gazing at, what you're giving attention to, what you're focused on in your mind, the goal in life. Then you'll be stretching forth your hand as you get a picture in your mind of what you wish to achieve. Touch this with faith in the divine wisdom to bring it forth, and you will see it made manifest on the screen of space. You will be satisfied for a while, then a divine discontent will stir you again causing you to aim higher and higher, and so on to infinity. To stretch forth your hand, when psychologically understood, is the soundest, simplest, and most wonderful philosophy any man can have. I say unto you, stretch forth your hand, do it now. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter on my, under my roof. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth and to another come, and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he doeth it. 
When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. This is from the seventh chapter of Luke, sixth and tenth verse. Related passages are in Matthew and also in John. Here is a technique of absent treatment portrayed in a beautiful and simple way. Of course, there is no absence in the one presence. But you might be praying for someone sick a thousand or two thousand miles away or someone in the hospital. You are told how to pray for another or send your word and heal him or her. When you pray for another or give what is termed a mental and spiritual treatment or prayer therapy, you simply correct what you hear and see in your mind by knowing and feeling the other's freedom and peace of mind. Faith comes to you as you leave the literal interpretation of life and enter into the psychological, spiritual interpretation of life. Many of you, like the speaker, were no doubt in the United States Army, and you know how to take orders. A soldier is conditioned to obey implicitly his superior officers. After considerable training, the soldier becomes disciplined. That is, his mind and body are definitely bent to certain actions. The officer is a man of authority. He has learned to command. But first he had to learn to take orders himself. And he too is subject to authority from his superiors. The president of the country is subject to authority also, as all of you know by now. When you pray for another, you must be a good soldier. You must learn how to stand at attention and follow the order, eyes right. You must give attention to the spiritual values or truths of life and keep your eyes right by seeing. Spiritual perception, of course, means the eye. By seeing the other as he ought to be, happy, peaceful, and free. Praying for the other, you see the other, happy, joyous, free. You see him vital and alive, bubbling over with enthusiasm. You must begin to discipline your thoughts, feelings, emotions, and faculties. You know very well that you can begin now to pray for somebody else. If your thoughts wander, bring them back and say to them, I told you to give attention to harmony, health, and peace, or whatever it is you're focusing or concentrating on. If you're praying for your father, or mother, or sister, or brother, you, naturally, you do not see them in a hospital. You're fastening the disease on them, and you're also uh, thinking about the symptoms and the pains and the aches, and also whatever you're thinking of, you're attracting to yourself. No, you never see a loved one in the hospital or anybody you're praying for. The person is home, and that person is telling you about the miracle of God that has happened in his or her life. You see them vital, alive, smiling, telling you about the miracle of God that has taken place in their lives. That is prayer. That would be prayer therapy. That would be scientific treatment because your affirmation, your prayer must agree with your vision. Your image that you have in your mind must agree with what you affirm. If you affirm one thing and then you see the person in the hospital sick and weak and emaciated and all that, uh, that's called hypocrisy in the Bible. You're uh, denying what you're affirming. You're saying what you're saying one thing and seeing another. No, the two must agree. If you look back in your life, you'll realize that it was your image that you had in your mind that was always made manifest. Therefore, you don't see your father sick in the hospital. Your father is at home, at home doing what he always did. Your mother is also home, and she's doing what she loves to do, the things she always uh, was always did. You know, she's doing them now. And she's telling you about that wonderful miracle that happened in her life. Then your, your affirmation is agreeing with your image. 
two shall agree, as touching on something on earth, shall be established that my Father which is in heaven. And the Father in heaven is your own thought and feeling, your brain and your heart, the two uniting, for your thought and feeling are spiritual agencies, and these two together, when they unite in harmony and in peace, of course, there's an issue from that union. And that union can be guidance, peace, or harmony. When the brain and the heart unite, your prayer is answered. When your conscious and subconscious agree, your prayer is answered. The servants spoken of are your thoughts, ideas, moods, feelings, and attitudes of mind. They serve you nobly <clears throat> or negatively, depending on the orders you issue. If you are an employer, you may order the employees to do certain things in the store. You expect them to obey. You are paying them to conform to your business methods and processes. In the same manner, you order your thoughts around. You are the master, not the serf or the slave. Surely you do not and will not permit the gangsters of hate, fear, prejudice, jealousy, rage, and incurability to water you around and make a football of you. You're in control. You're the master. You have dominion. When you begin to discipline your mind, you do not permit doubt, anxiety, and false impressions of the world to browbeat, intimidate, and push you around. You are conditioning your mind so that you definitely issue orders to your thoughts to give attention to your aims in life, to your ideals. Likewise, you direct and channel all your emotions constructively. You have complete dominion. You can't visualize or imagine an emotion. You must remember that emotion follows thought. And when you control your thoughts and mental imagery, you are in charge of your emotions. No person, place, or thing can annoy you, disturb you, or hurt you. They do not have that authority. For example, another could call you a skunk. Are you a skunk? Someone might say you're a snake in the grass. Are you a snake in the grass? You're not. The suggestions or statements of the other could not affect you except through your thought. You have the capacity and the power to curse or bless. You can say, God's peace fills my soul. I'm in tune with the infinite. God is guiding me. Your thought in such instance could be, God's peace fills that man's mind. Fills your own mind, of course, too. You are in charge of the movement of your mind. You can move in anger, hate, or revenge. Also, you can move in peace, harmony, and goodwill. Never give others power to disturb you. You're putting them on a pedestal and making gods and goddesses out of them. Realize they have no power to disturb you. The power is in you. The I am, the Lord, that healeth thee, the one presence and the one power. There is no other. It's omnipotent and supreme. Why then should you bow down to false gods? The disciplined mind is accustomed to take a spiritual medicine called in tune with the infinite. The moment you are tempted to react negatively, identify immediately with your aim. Your aim is peace, it's harmony, it's wisdom, it's right action, it's accomplishment, achievement. Switch to your ideal immediately, and you have overcome and are victorious. You're a man of authority, and you say to your thoughts, servants, go and they go, come and they come. Isn't that a simple explanation? Anyone can understand it. You can give your faculty of imagination to anything you wish, such as lack, loss, or misfortune. You can discipline, direct, and focus your imagination on success, health, and prosperity also. What you imagine and feel is true comes to pass. Let your imagination become the workshop of God, which is what it should be. This lecture, this cassette that you're listening to, is also in book form. It's in a book form called How to Use Your Healing Power, one of the books I wrote many years ago. And if you'd like to read it, you can also have, have it in book form. The title of it is How to Use Your Healing Power, taken, of course, from the Bible, the Great Bible Healings. 
Let me cite the misuse of imagination. A mother whose son is rather late arriving home begins to imagine that he's met with some disaster. She sees in her vivid, distorted, twisted mind mental pictures of him on a hospital cot or she dramatizes an accident in her imagination. She can send her word and heal him and herself also. She must learn how to pray scientifically and become a good soldier who follows orders. You are under holy orders when you pray. Order means orders of the Holy One. There's only one presence and power. That's the God within you. You have surrendered your ego and intellectual pride in your own thoughts, viewpoints, and perspective, yielding to the God wisdom within. You are under orders now to bring forth harmony, health, peace, joy, wholeness, and beauty in the world. You are here to let your light so shine before men that they see your good works, thereby glorifying your Father which is in heaven. You must have faith and complete trust in the omnipotence, omniscience, and boundless love of the infinite, which seeks only to express itself through you. Identify yourself mentally and emotionally with the Divine Presence. You feel and know that you are a channel for the manifestation of all of God's attributes, qualities, and potencies, and that God flows through you as harmony, health, peace, joy, and abundance. As you make a habit of this kind of prayer, by frequently repeating or affirming these truths, your mind will become imbued with eternal verities, and you will find yourself under a divine compulsion to bring forth only the good, the beautiful, and the true. You have placed yourself under all holy orders, or orders of the Holy One, the God Presence, the Living Spirit within you. You become what is called a God-directed man, a divinely ordained person whose sole mission in the world is to follow the orders of the Holy One who inhabiteth eternity, whose name is perfect. Whose orders are you carrying out? Ye are servants to whom ye yield yourself, servants to obey. Whatever idea I yield to or give myself to will dominate, control, and compel me to act it out as frustration and expression. Whose order do you think the woman was obeying when she had all kinds of misgivings about her little boy, bombarding him with a barrage of negation, of negation, I should say, and with dire forebodings, which, if continued, would have had catastrophic implications? This woman was taking her orders from the thoughts of fear, worry, and anxiety. In other words, the marauders and intruders in her mind were browbeating her and making her a nervous wreck. Begin now to stretch forth your hand by realizing there is no limit to your possibilities. Feel and believe the Divine Presence is your silent partner, counseling, directing, and governing you. As you do this, your life will be wonderful and satisfying. It will be more useful and constructive than it is. Begin to know yourself. Try the amazing power of true prayer. And prayer is the contemplation of the truths of God from the highest standpoint. When you say, God loves me and cares for me, you're praying. There's the response. When you say, God is guiding me now, that's prayer. There is a guiding principle. Its nature is responsiveness. It's called infinite intelligence, the nature of which is responsiveness. Call upon me and I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will set you on high because you had known my name. The name means the nature of the power. And the nature of it is to respond to you when you call on it. As you yield yourself to the divine wisdom within, you will live a better life than you ever dreamed of. Arise, take up thy bed, 
your bed is your new mental attitude, and walk the earth, radiant, happy, and free. Take up the power of the infinite, which is within you, it's all-powerful, and through the power of the Almighty, you rise and accomplish great things. Now, when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bear him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up, and began to speak. Here is a wonderful psychological and spiritual drama taking place in the consciousness of man. The dead man in the Bible is your desire which you have failed to realize or to manifest. You may have had a desire to sing, perhaps the, uh, the wonderful gift of music or song is within you. And if you haven't realized it, you said, I can't do it, I don't know the right people, I don't know the right congressmen, and all this sort of thing, well then, it's dying within you, isn't it? The desire is dying, or it may be dead. But as you claim, you now are what you long to be, and realize through the power of the Almighty, you will sing the song of triumph. Then you're resurrecting the dead man within yourself, or in sickness either. The, um, you may have a lingering illness. Well, if you have, that's the death of health, isn't it? Therefore you realize, I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord thy God, I will come and heal thee. I will restore health unto thee, and heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. So you realize the miraculous healing power of God is flowing through you, vitalizing, healing, restoring your whole being into God's pattern on the mount, which is the pattern of harmony, health, and peace. According to your belief is it done unto you, the Bible says. To believe something is to accept it as true. We are told the dead man was the son of a widow. A widow is a woman whose husband is dead. When we are not married mentally and emotionally to God and his truths, we are truly dead to peace, joy, health, happiness, and inspiration. In the book of Isaiah, you are told point blank, Thy maker is thy husband. And the maker, of course, is the God presence. God's ideas should control your mind. The eternal verity should be dominant in your conscious mind. And when you enthrone these ideas, godlike thoughts in your conscious mind, they generate a lovely emotion, and your heart becomes a chalice for God's love. And then wonders begin to happen in your life. A true widow is one whose husband is God or the good, and who is not governed by sin's evidence and worldly belief. The son, the widow's son, the son, the desire of such a woman will not remain dead because she turns to the God presence within, the almighty power, which is the only creative power within her, and with the door of her five senses closed, she completely rejects all that her senses deny. Silently and lovingly she claims and feels herself to be what she longs to be, knowing in her heart that the living Spirit Almighty will honor and validate her claim. She lives, moves, and has her being in the mental atmosphere of complete acceptance as she continues to qualify or condition her consciousness in this way, she reaches an inner conviction, thereby resurrecting the dead man within her. Her inner mood of triumph is her, is her Lord commanding the dead man, young man, I say unto thee, arise. I'm sure you have experienced that in your own life. You've resurrected some dead state in you. As a doctor friend of mine told me that she was paralyzed, a heavy machine fell upon her. She had to learn to walk again. She had to learn to talk again. But she realized that there was a power and she kept on realizing, claiming, feeling, and knowing, oh yes, she got medical attention, blessing the doctors, of course, and all who helped her, because all healing is spiritual anyhow. And she walks, and she talks, 
and she's been ministering to people for the last 30 years. Uh, she did that through the power of the Almighty. She said, God gave me a voice and I'll speak again and I'll counsel people again and I'll walk again. And she pictured herself walking and doing all the things she would do as a doctor. And she kept it up. Now, the uh, resurrection of your desire is the external manifestation of the subjective embodiment or the joy of the answered prayer. Whatever we appropriate and assimilate in our mentality, we resurrect. When it says the dead man stood up and began to speak, it means that when your prayer is answered, you speak in a new tongue. A tongue means a mood, a feeling, an awareness. It's uh, the language of the soul. It's a vibration, an attitude of mind. When you're healed, don't you speak in a new tongue? You're vibrant, you're alive, you're bubbling over with enthusiasm, you're grateful, and you're telling everybody about the miraculous healing. You're speaking in a new tongue. You're no longer talking about sickness and paralysis and all the rest of it, are you? No, of course you're not. Uh, the sick man who is healed speaks in the tongue of joyous health and exudes an inner radiance. It isn't a man speaking a lot of gibberish, which nobody understands. You can hypnotize a man, you know, tell him now he's speaking in foreign tongues. And you'll get, the, you get a lot of gibberish from him, won't you? Our dead hopes and desires speak when we bear witness to our inner beliefs and assumptions. As a corollary to this, I would like to relate about a young man I saw in Ireland many years ago. He was a distant relative. He was in a comatose condition. His kidneys had not functioned for two days. I went to see him accompanied by one of his brothers. I knew he was a devout Roman Catholic and I said to him, Jesus is right here and you see him. He is putting his hand out and is this moment laying his hands on you. I repeated this several times, slowly, gently and positively. He was in a comatose condition. He was unconscious when I spoke and was not consciously aware of the presence of any of us. He sat up in bed opened his eyes and said, Jesus was here. I know I am healed. I shall live. What happened? Well, you know very well what happened. This man's unconscious or subconscious mind accepted, accepted my statement that Jesus was there and his subconscious projected that thought form. That is, this man's concept of Jesus was portrayed based on what he saw in church statues, paintings, and so forth. He believed Jesus was there in the flesh, that he had placed his hands upon them. There, <clears throat> you, uh, you can tell a man in a trance form, in a trance form, that his grandfather is here and that he will see him clearly. That is to say, if you hypnotize a person, a woman or a man, and say to him, you're now in a deep trance and your grandmother or grandfather is right here and he you will see him and talk with him. He will see what he believes to be his grandfather. His subconscious projects the image of his grandfather based on his subconscious memory picture. You can give the same man a post-hypnotic suggestion saying to him, when you come out of the trance or hypnotic state, you will greet your grandfather and talk to him, and he will. This is called a subjective hallucination. The faith kindled in the subconscious of my Catholic relative based on his firm belief that Jesus came to heal him was the healing factor. In other words, he accepted it and the subconscious healed him. It is always done unto us according to our faith, our mental conviction. And the, whether the object of our faith is true or false, we'll get results from the subconscious mind. For there's only one healing presence it's the infinite healing presence lodged in the subconscious of every man, woman, and child in this entire world. 